All right, before we open God's Word together, quick update. Uh, for those of you getting Jen's emails, uh, you know most of the latest information going on with uh, Jen and her parents and also with myself. Um, but for now, so the latest with Jen's mom, um, she has been slightly progressing. She's still moving in the right direction. Um, which is a huge answer to prayer. Thank you, everyone who's continuing to pray for her mom. She, yeah, it's a big deal. Um, she definitely, at first it seemed the doctors didn't expect her to make it this far. Um, it's been three weeks since the motorcycle accident. Um, she's off all sedation meds at this point, um, except they put her on a little bit uh, yesterday because they took the um, life support tube out of her throat and the feeding tube out of her nose and they ended up putting in a trach um, so she can get the assistance breathing that way and also feeding tube in her stomach. So that was a big deal yesterday, everything went well. And so the plan is still kind of in the next three to five days, they're gonna assess her and kind of see what that means for life support, being able to take her off and have her breathe on her own and see how she's doing um, with the injuries to her brain. So please continue to pray for all the same things from the swelling going down um, to her blood pressure. It got a little high, so they had to um, sedate her a little bit because of that. But this whole process, obviously, is just kind of moment by moment and trusting God moment by moment. So be in prayer for her and Jen's family. That would be amazing. So we got, um, you know, definitely a busy few days ahead of us. Um, kind of seeing what, what God's going to do and praying for mom. Um, and then for me, uh, those who got the email, I think this was on it, but maybe not. Um, but tomorrow I go in for my bone marrow biopsy um, and a couple scans and labs. And that's kind of step one in treatment for this clinical trial I'm in. Um, so that's going to be a big all day extravaganza at City of Hope tomorrow. Um, but so we're praying for that. I'm very thankful for uh, the doctor ordering my bone marrow biopsy with sedation. <laughs> <sighs> Not, you know, I don't want to be awake for that. Uh, so I get to take a nap uh, tomorrow morning and they'll take care of it. Um, and then we'll go from there in the next couple of weeks. So if you got the email, the whole glass drum kit structure in front of me saying hi, um, you know, I don't want to do that. Uh, but I might be a consistent mask wearer at, uh, in the near future, um, just because my cancer treatment's going to diminish my body's natural defenses pretty significantly. So you can pray for me about that, and, and then we'll keep going for it, right? And then we'll see what God does. Oh, right? A mask with a mustache. We'll just draw it on. That would, that would be amazing. Yeah, hey, I like that. All right, so why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for our church family. And uh, Lord, there's, there's plenty of Christians today who just don't realize the importance of a church family and church community, Lord where we don't just listen to your word and hear it and agree with it, but we live it out in community together, that we get to worship you together, that we get to grow in our faith together, we get to share life together. And so, Lord, we thank you for this togetherness and unity you've given us by your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us understanding this morning by your same Holy Spirit that you would reveal things to us from your holy word, Lord, that we've never been able to understand or see before. May we be awed by you this morning in your greatness and the greatness of your plan for us. And Lord, may we worship you today. Thank you for this time and give me the assistance I need to speak your word clearly and faithfully. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So today's title is called The Wedding Day. Revelation 19 is a fun one. Very excited to share it with you. And God in his timing just always blows me away. I shouldn't be surprised, but I definitely enjoy God's sovereign timing of all things. And especially pastoring and going through scripture with you 
it's been such a joy of mine to see how God has lined up so many things we're studying in Scripture with what He's doing in our lives or even in our culture. You think back to 2020 and the pandemic and when it started and how we were in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the weeks leading up and the week right before the 15-day lockdown. 15 days, right? No, I'm not going to get in there. But a pastor friend of mine I was talking to, and he goes, how flat does this curve have to be? Which is kind of funny. Um, but when, right before that happened, the whole message was about not being anxious about tomorrow and how God led us through and prepared us for all that, all that we've been going through. And even yesterday, just happened to go to a wedding for a good friend of mine. Uh, one of my closest friends, he's a pastor, and uh, he and his wife were celebrating their vows with all their friends and family. And so Jen and I went and got to see uh, some of my friends from high school, guys I wrestled with on the team together, uh, those in the Calvary Chapel network of churches that I've known over the years, kind of that whole group was there. And uh, I got to show them how I married up, which was fun. Um, <clears throat> But what was also interesting is we're walking around and I'd go up and I'd say hi to somebody like, man, I was, I saw this guy over there and I'm going, who's the guy with the mustache? And they couldn't point out, figure out who I was. And I introduced myself They're like, oh, and then they got it. And then I shared with a couple friends because I had my black rimmed sunglasses on. I said, if you look carefully now, you know those fake mustache, nose, glass combos that people wear? Mine looks exactly like that and they couldn't unsee it after that. It looks like the fake nose, fake mustache, everything. Um, so I was a little incognito yesterday, but the thing that I love about weddings is it always makes me reflect upon my wedding with my wife. Um, arguably the most enjoyable day of my life. And people say that, oh, it's a blur. You don't remember it. We remember every aspect of that day. And there isn't a single thing I would change. And even just the wedding plans and leading up to it. So I started thinking about what our experience was like, Jen and I, and we're going to celebrate 22 years uh, this week. And leading up, yeah, Woo! right. And what's amazing about the wedding day is all the preparation that goes into it, all the planning, all the hopefulness, all the joy associated with that coming day. And I had absolute confidence in the fact that God had handpicked Jen for me, that before I was born, he picked her out and likewise me for her. And that confidence has only grown the more she and I face and endure different things in life together. The more God's choosing is, has been definitely apparent. And as we, and I say she, made all the wedding plans and preparations, I just had to show up. And I couldn't wait for that day to show up. The day would find, where I would finally see my bride dressed in white, walking, actually she bounced down the aisle towards me, and it was the greatest moment of my life when I got to see my bride down that aisle. It filled me with so much hope, wonder, and awe in regards to what God had planned for us together. And so my heart was filled with this great anticipation and this joy of the coming day. And that's the type of joy we read in Revelation 19. It is the wedding supper of the Lamb. It is the wedding ceremony. It is the wedding reception. All prepared, all ready for Christ to receive his church. So that joy and anticipation that the groom feels towards his bride is how Christ feels towards us in the last day. That all of human history from the first coming of Jesus and his ministry and his life and then his death on the cross for our sins and him being in the grave for three days, rising again on that third day and then ascending to heaven 40 days later, all of that was working towards the wedding day. And so those preparations, we've been in a time of preparing for the wedding day. 
In Revelation 19, we read those things that had to take place. Every obstacle towards our union with Christ has to be removed. So what are some of the obstacles that get in the way of the wedding day? Sin, that's what gets in the way. Pride, selfishness, all kind, other people, other people's expectations. And yet for Christ and his bride, the church, it's sin. And so God the Father sent his son to deal with our sin. So that obstacle would be removed from our union and relationship with Christ. So Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Also the devil, he's quite an obstacle, is he not? His seduction, his lies, his deception, how he's been working in the world, sowing seeds of discord, trying to get humanity to rebel against their creator. And he's done that our entire history. He's doing that today and he'll do that in the future. But in the future, on this last day, the devil will be dealt with. All of his agents of unrighteousness will be dealt with. All those who have rebelled against Christ, who have partnered with the enemy, God will deal with on this last day at his second coming. And Jesus comes as a warrior, but that warrior is also that bridegroom who comes for his church. And that's what we read at the end of Revelation 19. We won't get to that today, but today is all about this wedding day where he had dealt with sin. He deals with the devil and he deals with death because Jesus overcame death on the cross so that all those who believe in him will overcome death. We got a chance to uh, do uh, Nancy Robinson's memorial service this week. That's Lacey and Matt Lemons. That's Lacey's mom. Uh, she had passed away from uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, um, about a month ago. And so we went up to Shaver Lake this week, uh, did the celebration of life. And one of the greatest things I got to share with her family and friends is that death doesn't win. Amen. That it has no victory for the believer. That it doesn't have the final word. The final word is Jesus, and he has given us life in that name. And that's what we get to celebrate. And so you can think about the greatest celebration you've ever been a part of. And it will pale in comparison to the celebration on this last day when every obstacle to your relationship with Jesus is done and over with. Sin, the devil, death, all dealt with. And we get to enjoy our union with Christ in our new life with him together. You see, when I married Jen, it was all about this new life that we would share together. And when we are caught up to the heavenly realm and we join Christ and he deals with all wickedness, he's gonna create a new heaven and new earth and it will be about our life with him together. It will be a picture of that union and that relationship that we long for and there will no longer be any obstacles in our way. You see, Revelation 16 through 20, where we're kind of at in this section of this great book, is God is dealing with evil. And in 19, where we're at, he's dealt with the wicked nations, epitomized by the city of Babylon. And we read that when I preached three weeks ago about how God caused this wicked civilization throughout the world, Babylon, to finally fall. Babylon is that symbolic city that has led the world astray into false doctrine and beliefs. It has killed and persecuted the believers, and God has now executed his judgment upon it, wiped it out with the armies of the earth, and that wicked civilization and city is no more. And now this chapter is all about praising God for dealing with the evil that has plagued humanity. So why don't we go ahead and read it together, Revelation 19, 1 through 10, and why don't you stand with me in honor of God's word. Let's read verse 1 together. After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice 
of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down, worshiped God who is seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You can be seated. Just so you know, what follows next is a rider on a white horse, faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And this is Jesus showing up on the last day at his second coming to make every wrong right. But before that, we have this heavenly scene of worship. John is getting a vision and a picture again of what's going on in the heavenly realm. And so in regards to this wedding day that is approaching, you have the guests, you have those who are in attendance who are coming to participate and celebrate with the bride and groom. Now this example of the bride and groom, we see it all throughout scripture, especially in Ephesians 5, and I want to read it to you. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So on this hand, you have husbands and their relationship with their wives, that they are to love them how? The way Jesus loves his church. So in the marriage covenant, biblically speaking, we have an example of how we are to love and live with our spouse. Husbands are to love their wives. Amen. In the way that Jesus loved his church. How did Jesus love his church? He laid down his life for her. And so the husband is to lay down his life for his wife. It's interesting that much of the disagreements and conflict that arises in marriage is when we get things wrong biblically. And when a man lays down his life, his desires, and his wants for his wife, for her good and her blessing, the wife is incredibly loved. But when he upholds his rights and his life and his wants, she feels forgotten. Should we be surprised by that? Or is that exactly how God intended the marriage relationship to function? That we as men are called by God to die to ourselves. That same command is not given to the woman in the same way. As a believer, male or female, we are to die to ourselves. And wives, believe me, understand what it's mean to die to themselves. Especially if they're a wife and then... Then come the kids, if you have kids, and talk about dying to yourself, right? Uh, Moms constantly. But it's one of those dynamics in marriage that our marriages flourish when we obey God's word. It's, It's that simple. But we don't die easily, do we? To our own desires. Um, We fight for them. We try to keep things equal. And there is no 
equal. It is you give everything. And that's how God intended it. And it's because Jesus gave everything. He wouldn't ask you to do something he himself has not done. He has given you the example. He's given his Holy Spirit in order to do that. And the more we die to ourselves as Christ did, the more our marriages live and flourish. But we have here the wedding day and we have Jesus giving his life for his church. And so this example of Christ and his bride, the church, is what fills this entire passage, these 10 verses. And look at verse one with me as we get to the first sound of this celebration. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude. So multitude of who or what, we don't know yet, but they're so loud, it's like they have one voice and it's a loud voice and they're crying out with this phrase. It's the transliteration of a Hebrew word and it's hallelujah. Nowhere in all the New Testament has this word shown up yet. Isn't that interesting? And it shows up four times in these 10 verses. Nowhere else in the New Testament. Is it in the Old Testament? All over the place. When you read praise the Lord, you're reading hallelujah. And so it's given four times in this one section. And the point is, is that God's getting the praise for whatever just happened He's getting worshiped in a way that it has not happened before. Heaven is not quiet, it is loud. And have you pictured heaven as a sterile, serene, quiet place? If you have kids, you're like, I don't know what that place is. <laughs> sterile, no. Quiet, no. And here you have heaven is depicted as a loud roar of the multitude. And their praises are roaring out of salvation and glory and power belong to our God. You see, this is not quiet like a library or a doctor's office. This is loud like the greatest concert you've ever attended. Like the greatest sporting event you've ever witnessed. It is something that would make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. It's something that in this life we get glimpses of, but we've never experienced anything like this. The first concert I ever went to, my dad took me, and it was Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. That was my first experience with a live concert. Um, I smelled something I've never smelt before <laughs> at that concert, uh, but I know it when I catch a whiff of it now, what that substance is, um, but that concert experience was something else. The crowd was electric. Every song, everybody knew. I didn't know a single song at that point, and yet I pretended like I did. I was in, I think, eighth grade at the time, and it was amazing. Every time I hear Tom Petty now, I think of my dad. And then the greatest sporting event I witnessed I would say it was a college football game, UCLA versus USC. I was in eighth grade. I was a US, UCLA fan. My dad took me. Um, I was UCLA gear head to toe, right? And this is when Troy Aikman was still the quarterback for UCLA. And this year, the, it was scored 1919 in the final seconds of the game. And the crowd, college football is way more exciting than NFL. They are trying to make it happen. They're not worried about a contract. They want everybody to see who they are, and they are risking everything to make it happen. And no joke, they bring in UCLA has a chance to win with a field goal. It's a 54-yard field goal. They pull their first string out. They put their second string kicker in who has more power, but he's less accurate. And USC almost blocks the kick. It goes up. It is dead center. It's end over end, and it hits the upright and bounces back to the 40-yard line. No score. No overtime in college football then. Everybody goes, oh. This exhale from the crowd, and this is how everybody left the stadium. <laughs> Nobody won. And that is what the world offers. No win. 
big letdown, all the cheering, all the promises, all the hope of victory, and you trust in the world and its ways and nothing. That's what happens to those who live their life without Christ. They think they've got the victory. They're going to win. All these great things are going to happen. And in the end, nobody wins. Unless you trust in Christ, the one who's already won that victory. And then you will be at the greatest event in human history, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it will be like the greatest concert and sporting event all wrapped into one. And it's going to be loud. It's going to be rowdy. People are going to be coming unglued because every hope, every promise, everything we have ever hoped for will be met in Jesus and in his victory. That's the wedding day we get to be a part of. And that is what we are reading about here. That is why I believe we get the term hallelujah four times in this chapter because it is the word that sums up the celebration of the saints. We get to praise the Lord for what? His salvation, his glory, and his power. And they all belong to our God. Please take note of that. These three things belong to God and God alone. Nobody else possesses salvation for you. Nobody else possesses his glory or his power. All belong to God and he administers them according to his will. He saves according to his will. He shows his power according to his will and he receives all glory according to that same will. Yet so many people think salvation belongs to many different belief systems many different people or ideologies or things. Salvation is God's sole possession. Nobody else owns it. And he gives it to whom he pleases. Verse two, for his judgments, and this is why this multitude in heaven is proclaiming this phrase of hallelujah. Hallelujah. For his judgments are true and just. He's just judged Babylon, the wicked city. So the fact that God, who has been long suffering towards sin, 2 Peter 3 says, so that none should perish, we are in that time of long suffering now, where in human history, people ask, why do bad things happen to good people? Wrong question. It's why do good things happen to bad people? Because deep down, we're all bad people. No, no, we're good. Really? We have good aspects to us. We're not wholly and completely bad, but at our core, everything we do is tainted by our own sinful desires. So the Bible declares of us, we're in need of a savior and salvation. But you have a scenario here where God, if he were to judge all evil right now, there are many who would spend eternity in hell. And there are many whom God has designed and desired to save in his grace. He knows those who are his and he's waiting until every single one has come into the fold. So in order for everyone to be saved, who's going to be saved, God in his sovereignty has allowed sin and evil to exist in this world for a limited time. That's why sin, sickness, death, and evil are still happening. But there is a day where God says, you know what? It's done. Evil is over. Its reign has ended. And now it is time for me, God Almighty, to rule and reign in righteousness forever. That is the day of the wedding of the Lamb. That is what is happening when Christ takes his throne, and he reigns over heaven and earth with his bride, his church. And so you have God being worshiped by this multitude. And I didn't answer who the multitude is because honestly, I'm not quite sure. In the gospels, whenever it talks about a great multitude, Luke 23, 27 says, and there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. This is when Jesus had been beaten they put a cross on his back. He carried it part of the way. Then they grabbed Simon of Cyrene, put Jesus' cross on his back, and he carried it the rest of the way. This great multitude followed Jesus 
as his cross was being born. So a great multitude are people who follow Jesus. In Revelation, we're told that the great multitude are people in heaven who follow Jesus. That's Revelation 7, 9. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that nobody could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. So now it's people who follow Jesus in this life, and now they are following Jesus in heaven, and they are worshiping him there. So to me, it seems that this great multitude are the human population of heaven. But some commentators have said that it's the angelic beings because in verse 6 of this chapter, it seems like there's another great multitude that begin to praise him. Not sure which it is yet. It could be either one. But nonetheless, we have God being worshiped for his judgments, which are true and just. Why? Because he has judged the great prostitute, which we know is Babylon, that symbolic city. In John's day, Babylon was the city of Rome, and all it had done to kill the saints and persecute the church. In the end days, right before Jesus returns, which could be now, we don't know if we're in that last day or days or not. We're definitely getting closer every day. Uh, there's definite signs that point towards it. But whenever Jesus returns, we're going to know that that great wicked civilization that rules over the earth will be judged and then Christ will return. And that's going on here. And that's why heaven is erupting in spontaneous praise. And once more, they cried out the second hallelujah, praise the Lord, the smoke from her, that wicked city goes up forever and ever. Well, that is a reference to Sodom and Gomorrah. In that wicked, sexually immoral society where God pulled Lot and his family out, God judged it with fire. And the same thing he does to the city of Babylon in Revelation. He judges it with fire and it burns. And the kings of the earth and the merchants of the earth in Revelation 18 see the smoke of her going up into heaven forever and ever. It is a sign of God's good and righteous judgment against wicked humanity. That is not a judgment for the believer. That is a judgment for all those who have rebelled against God and his Christ and turned away from him. But to us who believe, we are the ones shouting, praise the Lord, hallelujah, for his righteous judgments. Confirmed by this next verse, the 24 elders, remember that first vision of heaven where there's the one who sits upon the throne, there are four living creatures with eyes and wings that are around the throne crying out, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, night and day. And then you have 24 thrones and 24 elders who take their crowns, throw them down before the lamb who is slain and they worship him. Those 24 elders are symbolic of the Old Testament people of God and the New Testament people of God. It is the Old Testament saints symbolized by the 12 patriarchs, the sons of Israel and the 12 tribes. And then you have the 12 apostles of the New Testament who preach the gospel to all the nations. You have the people of God symbolized here. And what are they doing? They are crying out and worshiping God who is seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah, or praise the Lord. You know, weddings, I believe, are supposed to be worshipful. That was one of the things that Jen and I united in this decision when we got married and talked about our wedding ceremony is we wanted our wedding ceremony to be a time of worship. We wanted God to get the glory for what he had done in our life and what he planned to do. So every song we chose was a worship song. We were fresh off the mission field as well. Jen had been on the mission field for two and a half years before she met me. Um, I was gone for a mere six months but on the mission field. But nonetheless, when we came back, there were certain things we did on outreach to share the gospel. There were dances, skits, sign language songs. And there was one that we even did in the middle of our service before we pronounce you husband and wife 
we did a sign language song to Lord, I give you my heart because we wanted our family and friends, all our guests to understand that the joy that we were showing and experiencing then and there was one that was rooted in Christ and his plan for us. And we wanted him to be worshiped for it not to be about us, but about him. And you see this worship service of this wedding ceremony is about him. It's about God being seen for who he is. And I did a little research last night on some worship songs we sing these days. And some of those websites you go to are hypercritical. Some are just very uh, permissive. But there were certain songs that this author was arguing we really shouldn't sing in church because they're about us and not about the Lord at all. Some of them are the boyfriend songs where if you didn't know any better, it's a song about a boyfriend rather than about Jesus because his name isn't even present. Um, it, It could be about anybody who you're in love with rather than about the gospel and Christ and who God is. And worship songs should really be about who God is. And this wedding, this worship service is definitely about who God is and what he's done in dealing with evil. And from the throne came a voice saying, praise our God, all you his servants who fear him small and great. Now, because it's a voice from the throne, you would assume that it's the voice of God. But it's weird for God to refer to himself in the third person here saying praise our our God in this way. God doesn't usually speak in this manner. So it's most likely one of the four living creatures around the throne or an angelic being giving the divine command for all his servants, both angelic servants and human servants, all those who fear him small and great to praise him. You know, one of the great judgments against the church today is the lack of fear in regards to the fear of the Lord. So many preachers throughout the last couple decades or so have emphasized so much of God being our friend, God being our counterpart, God being so easily approachable that we neglect his holiness and the fear of the Lord. We start to judge God on human terms. We start to think that we know better than him, that we question his ways and say, no, God's not good in doing that, or he's not right, or how could God do this, or how could God do that? And we start to instruct the Almighty. We start to be permissive with our own sin, thinking, well, he, did, he loves me, he'll just forgive me, rather than fearing the consequences of our disobedience. Because a good parent gives good consequences for bad choices, do they not? And if God is a good heavenly father, do you think he wants us to learn how to live our lives for him? And can we teach our children how to live their life without consequences for their actions? No, there has to be real and sometimes severe consequences for things. The law of consequences is a great tutor. And some people don't learn those lessons and they keep repeating them. And oftentimes we return to our sin because we have no fear of the Lord. It's interesting, this judgment. I want you to read Romans 3.10 with me. Turn there. Romans 3.10. Because I believe this is one of the number one problems in the American church today, or the Western church, is no fear of God. Uh, As you're turning to Romans 3.10, listen to Psalm 36.1. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. And some people want to diminish this and just say, oh, it's just you revere God. We're not supposed to fear him. Um, I had a healthy fear of my dad. Um, There were things that I just knew, you know what? You don't mess with dad in this area. You don't push it. Like it's not okay. And, And it wasn't like, oh no, I'm so scared of my dad because he's abusive. He wasn't. 
It was, I don't, I don't want to ignite his anger against me. I don't want harsh consequences for my decision making. I want to please my dad. And so there was a healthy fear of him. And many kids today don't have a healthy fear of their parents because many parents feel that they have to be their child's friend. They want to please their kids. Our kids have friends. They only have one, man, one mom and one dad. And they need us to be their parent, not their friend. Because a parent is far better than a friend. A parent will always support you, always be there for you, and will tell you the things you need to hear when you don't want to hear it. And so God is not just our friend. He's our God, he's our creator, and he is to be feared in the most holy and reverent way possible. The wicked have no fear of him, and that's why they do what they do. The righteous fear God and serve him only. Romans 3.10, none is righteous, no, not one. And now it's going to describe the wicked. All of us fit this category. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they become worthless. No one does good, not even one. So can anybody make it to heaven on their own? Nope. Okay. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. Listen to the last characteristic of the unbeliever. There is no fear of God before their eyes. God's servants, however, fear him. Small and great. Significant and insignificant. Those of great reputation and those of none. Those who fear him are those who matter to the Lord most. Then I heard, and now the sound gets louder. Greater roar. It seemed to be the voice of a great multitude like the roar of many waters. If you were standing on a boat next to Niagara Falls, have you ever been there? I haven't, so tell me if I'm wrong here. But you're there. I'm willing to bet your conversations are rather difficult because of the sound of crashing mighty waters. It's all you can hear. That is how heaven is. All you can hear is the praises of God for what he has done. Like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out the fourth hallelujah. Praise the Lord for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. You see, God has always reigned over all things. But he has not established his reign over all the earth in which wickedness is done away with until right before the wedding day. Right before the coming of Christ when he deals with the wicked Babylon, wicked cultures, wicked people, Satan, the father of all wickedness. Then the Lord God Almighty reigns over all things in power and in majesty. And so here is the cry of the saints of God. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. I learned something about weddings over these years. From my own wedding to the weddings I've performed to the wedding I attended last night, the wedding does not happen until the bride is ready. <laughs> right? And my buddy, it was funny because he was standing up there and it was very informal. It was out on a lawn at the Calvary Chapel Bible College and he's standing there and he's got his boys next to him and the audience is there on the lawn and we're just waiting. And he goes, I just want you to know, guys, she's coming. She's coming. No, 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 really. She is coming, like making a joke about it, like he got stood up, right? And then she walked down these steps and nobody noticed because there was no music playing. And she went, hi. <laughs> and everybody turned around and all attention was on the beautiful bride, right? Because she was finally ready. And I feel like that's how Jesus is with his church. He's waiting for his church to finally be ready. And I'm concerned about the bride of Christ today in our culture, in our environment because of the things being taught 
in some churches because of the liberalism and the immorality that's being taught from the pulpit, that's masquerading as Christianity, and the way in which the bride is meant to be in white, pure, virgin, set apart for the groom and him alone. And Babylon of our day is seducing the people of God in her sexual morality, in her pollution through media and all these things we give ourselves to. You look at any streaming service today and you will find a myriad of sinful, wicked things at your disposal being consumed regularly by our youth and by our adults. And you wonder why our culture is going astray and why the church is starting to approve of things it would have never approved of. Morality doesn't change because God does not change and right and wrong is based on his nature and his character. And yet you see many going the ways of Babylon. And Christ is going to return when his bride has made herself ready. And it says this about the bride. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. I need to wrap this up. But here's the point I want to make. The church. This is not the imputed righteousness of Jesus that is being referred to. You see, we are saved because of the righteousness of Christ. He hath clothed us, clothed us in his righteousness, taking away all of our sin, all of our filthiness, and he has clothed us in white. But here, the bride, it talks about the righteous deeds of the saints are the fine linen that makes up the garments of the church. That means that what you do for the Lord matters. It's how the church gets ready for his coming. We do righteous, godly things. We love our enemies. We forgive those we may not want to forgive. We preach the gospel. We live the gospel. We show the character of Christ in everything we do. Loving all people at all times for any reason. But speaking the truth in love. And not approving of sin and wickedness, but living our lives in righteousness because that is how the church gets herself ready. And that's when the groom comes. When the bride of Christ is pure in its doctrine and its activities. We're not there yet. But the church is to be working towards it. I'm going to need to Just read these. The angel said to me, write these. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. I'm going to pause right there. And I want you to hear that phrase. Blessed are those who are invited. Have you ever not been invited to a wedding? Kind of stinks, doesn't it? You're like, I wasn't going to go anyways, but I would have liked to have been invited. (laughs) But the bride and groom can't invite everybody, right? But sometimes to be on that receiving end where it's like, oh, like, I thought we were closer than that. And yet here you have God Almighty who invites you to this wedding day to be his guests. And it's not like he has all these blank name tags at the tables. And it's like, well, I'll just let whoever shows up to show up. No, your name is already written on that seat. Before the foundation of the world, before he ever made anything, he wrote your name and sent out the invitation. He's reserved your spot. But look at what happened. Matthew 22, Jesus told a parable. He says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. This is the gospel going out to the Old Testament people of God, the Israelites. They didn't accept the invitation. And again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Can you imagine being the groom and nobody wants to come to your wedding? 
That's how God the Father felt when he invited them to the wedding supper of his son. Nobody was willing to come. Verse 5, but they paid no attention. They went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. People came up with excuses why they couldn't come to this wedding day. The king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Did we not just read about Babylon being burned to the ground? Jesus was foretelling this very same thing. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants the apostles of the New Testament, went out into the roads, gathered all whom they found, both bad and good, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. That's why you and I get to be included in the wedding day. He sent out the invitation, but not everybody accepts it. Not everybody shows up to celebrate Christ. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment, And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot, cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. If you don't understand this parable, please go home and read it this week, Matthew 22. But I'll wrap up this point because we've got to take communion together. Is this point that there was a man in that gathering who did not have the garments. He did not have the imputed righteousness of Christ through faith in him, and he did not have the righteous deeds that accompany a life of faith. And he was kicked out into outer darkness, into hell itself. You see, we are invited, we are called to come, and if you receive that invitation, it's evidence that you have been chosen before the foundation of the world. He has those garments for you to wear. It is faith and a righteous life that God has for you. And those are the requirements to enter into heaven. Faith is what gets you in. The righteous deeds are what give evidence of that faith. And he says, come in, all who are here. You are all invited. But you gotta receive Jesus to come into that wedding day. Amen? Let's pray as the band comes up. And we're going to thank the Lord for the righteousness he has given us through faith in him. That we get to be a part of that great wedding day on the last day. Heavenly Father, we look to you now. As we prepare our hearts to celebrate your death upon the cross and your resurrection. I pray, Father, that in this time you would give us great hope of that coming wedding day. That we as the bride of Christ would make ourselves ready. That we would know our Savior, that we would walk in righteousness and seek repentance of sins where needed. And so, Lord, prepare our hearts as we get these elements prepared, and may we take them with hearts full of faith and gratitude towards you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. from the Lord 
what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take it together. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's do that together. Would you please stand with me? If you have had a wedding day of your own, or if you will have a wedding day someday, I want you to think about the joy that you felt leading up to that day. And I want you to understand that as great as that joy is and that wedding day can be, there is a wedding day that we all will be a part of who believe in Christ. And it is the true celebration of a lifetime. It is the one that we are to long for, to pray for, to get ready for, to make ourselves ready by believing in Christ and following him in this life. So you have seven days in front of you in this next week. Today is the first of those days. Make them count. Make them count for the Lord because you may not finish this week. You might see him sooner. And it's important for us to use each day to understand the nature of it being a gift and to use it for his glory. And that only happens when we walk in faith and we trust his goodness. Amen? Amen. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you guys. We love you.